Welcome to the Sawtor 7.2 Scoundrel Scrapper and Operative Concealment Guide. The most advanced complex class that I think exists in the game at this point. There's some real uh, contention between the different priorities in the priority uh, rotation uh, concept that we have to discuss and we'll get into details with that. Because of that, this guide might be a little bit on the longer side, but I feel if we don't do it justice, we won't get into the nit and grit of what makes this uh, class tick. It has incredible potential for DPS and some of the best survivability opportunities. So let's look at those survivability opportunities just real quick so we get a great positive of why we might want to consider this guide. Okay, we're in the game here. Uh, we're just going to cover some of the big, big pro effect that this class can do that some class can sort of do for a little bit, but they just cannot sustain it. And that has everything to do with Scamper. Um, so, Scamper has a mechanics in the Scrapper and the Lethal, uh, Scrapper and Concealment Advanced Classes that it doesn't just do when we roll with our scamper or extricate we have a two second Im immunity to any direct damage attacks and the ruffian and lethality class does not have that and we're going to demonstrate this what i'm going to do is we hear in master mode of red reaper we're in the second boss and if you can see there's six flags three blue three red when they all are the same color the boss has a beam attack that matches the color that they are and that beam attack does 600,000 damage we're at 400,000 hit points so that definitely beats us we could potentially use some defensives but I'm going to demonstrate how we can completely just totally ignore this. And keep in mind, our scamper is available. We get a new one every eight seconds. So we can do this once every eight seconds. So just to demonstrate that this boss does hit 600,000, I'm going to miss the first one. And a little trick here is that as we go in, I'm not going to do any heals so that the boss initially focuses on my companion. And that gets me to get... The whole ball rolling. So this is the first red beam. The flags are split, so it's going to do no damage. So. Flags are still split. Now there's the red beam. This one is going to kill me. Okay, and we can see that the damage was for 637,000. We're going to get back to this boss. Okay, back at the boss. This time I'm going to go ahead and kill him and demonstrate how we can avoid all of the damage. I'm going to be switching between dodge and scamper to avoid the damage um, that's evasion and extricate and uh, just pay attention to it I'll call it out and you can see that our, my companions hardly going to be doing any work for this fight I'm going to be putting some extra juice into it flags are still split so I don't have to worry about any damage so still split. Now I'm going to use my dodge. And since it's an instant cast, I can just go ahead and activate it. This time, I'll have to use a scamper. Okay. 
use evasion this time. Have to use a scamper this time. Dodge or evasion this time. Dodge. We'll have to use scamper this time. Dodge again. There, 27.2 DPS while I was doing all of that mechanics. I will speak only once. You are bold to venture aboard this ship, and you are a fool to seek confrontation. The age of the Republic and the Jedi is over. Okay, something that I felt that I needed to pay a little bit more attention to as we were going through the abilities is that you have two cleansers. Um, one is triage. Um, the Imperial side, it's known as toxin, toxin scan. And your dodge and ev or evasion on the burial side. You have to understand these in some fights. Uh, they are really, really, really handy. Uh, triage, like it says, will cleanse up to two negative tech physical effects meaning that if you have two stacks of something uh, it depends on the fight actually sometimes it'll cleanse one stack sometimes it'll cleanse the full stack and another one it really depends on how the game sets it up i can think of a few fights where the mechanics look a little bit different but your triage is um, a really good cleanse it also will cleanse slow effects um, as you saw me fighting um, in the Red Reaper fight, um, I was using this whenever I got knocked back and I didn't have a trick move. I would cleanse the slow off of me so that I can run in. Um, it's an instant cast, so it casts, but it does affect the global cooldown, but I can move while I do so. So it's really handy just to get back to the target. Uh, dodge and evasion works a little bit different. It's a super duper cleanse. Um, it'll cleanse anything that is cleansable off of your tray. So anything that's on your debuff, if you activate this, it'll cleanse it. You have to be aware of this because there's a few fights where this can be really, really bad, where you're not supposed to cleanse yourself. Somebody else is supposed to cleanse you because of the effects. Um, Revan, a fight uh, in the Operation uh, Temple of Sacrifice, you want to be careful on that fight in um, anything like in veteran mode because there's certain debuffs that you're not supposed to cleanse off of yourself and if you cleanse it off yourself you just keep on spreading it so be careful of this dodge it is can be really negative effect but it can also be amazing fix it's one of the mechanics that can allow you to solo mokan in the battle of rishi there's a technique where you can use the dodge to cleanse all of the stacks of you and rebuild the stacks up and manage your triage to cleanse, manage your number of stacks. Really, really handy little technique. But I thought I would just make aware that these are work as cleansers and you have to be very, very careful of how you use them. But at the same time, they're really, really powerful. Okay, the main class abilities on the Scoundrel Scrapper is Backblast, Bugnacity, Bludgeon, Blood Boiler, Sucker Punch, Crippling Shot, Vital Shot, Trick Move. The passives that we have to, to keep track of are Upper Hand, Fletch It Round, Hot and Ready. And we'll get into how these 
determine the priorities. Operative concealment is backstab, stem boost, veiled strike, volatile substance, laceration, crippling throw, corrosive dart, hollow traverse. Those passives are tactical advantage, acid blade, and revealing weakness. The when we have zero upper hands or zero tactical advantage, the priorities go back blast, pugnacity, bludgeon, blood boiler, crippling shot, trick move, and vital shot. Operative concealment is backstab, stem boost, veil strike, volatile substance, crippling throw, hollow traverse, corrosive dart. When we get one upper hand, it goes back blast, pugnacity, bludgeon, and then blood boiler, shocker punch, crippling shot, and vital shot all have equal priority since. Uh, We'll discuss some of the nuances related to where you might want to shuffle those abilities and what, requ what requires those considerations. I do want to point out that on Backblast and Bludgeon, you're looking at a doubling of the cooldown times of between Bludgeon and Backblast. So for every two Bludgeons, you're going to have one Backblast, and that is something that we can point out of how that nuance plays into um, the roles of priorities. With operative concealment, those abilities are backstab, stem boost, veil strike, volatile substance, laceration, crippling throw, corrosive dart. With two upper hands, scoundrel scrapper is going to be backblast, then equal of, then equal priorities between blood boiler, shocker punch, and vital shot. I'll discuss why vital shot is in here. It doesn't make sense until you understand some of the complexities. Operative concealment at two tactical advantages is backstab. Equal priorities between vitals, uh, volatile substance, laceration, and corrosive dart. Your ability tree is going to look something like this, and we'll go into more details as to what each of these roles uh, do. Your tactical is asset lash. Your implant is locked and load package. And tactician package. Let's get into the game and have a look at some of these mechanics. Okay, here in the game, um, I have my personal stats for if you want to keep track of that. And up here, I have um, the overlay of the abilities as they activate. There's a little bit of a delay, but if you want to make sure that you want to track which abilities I did in what sequence, that might be helpful to you. Um, so let's just look at our main abilities, Backblast, uh, crippling Shot, Sucker Punch, Bludgeon, Vital Shot, Blood Boiler, and then we have Pugnacity over here. One thing to take note of is that when we're facing our target, Back Blast is not activatable. From behind the target or even to the side, we can do Back Blast. Back Blast is a unique feature that it has two damage values. One is dealing damage that in this case is around 25,000. But if we use it from stealth, we have 32,000. And that's going to play a role into how we increase the damage. So we'll get into the ability tree and where those roles play without having to be in stealth. The next thing that we have to discuss is upper hands. Upper hands um, is something that plays a mechanical role in being able to use Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch is grayed out. When we get an upper hand, this icon over here on our buff tree, we need to keep an eye on that because with uh, the number of stacks that we have, that gives us an upper hand. There we used an upper hand. We can have a maximum of two upper hands at a time. So that is going to have to play a role in how we manage that um, stacks. Let's have a look at some other feature. Uh, we need to be aware of round two. So Flying Fist immediately regrants upper hands when hitting a bleeding target. This effect cannot occur more than once every 10 seconds. So the abilities that give us upper hands is Bludgeon. Uh, we're going to get into how Crippling Shot gives us a tactical advantage. Pugnacity gives us a tactical advantage. Trick Move gives us a tactical advantage. And then we have this round two that gives us a tactical advantage whenever there's a bleed effect on a target. Sometimes Vital Shot will play a role in that. We're not going to use Vital Shot all the time. It has a unique role in our rotation. Yeah. Um, and then the other tactical advantage can comes from that round two, but 
we have a bleed effect from back blast and that comes from Fletchet round. Load your shotgun with Fletchets causing back blast to deal an additional that internal bleed damage over six seconds so that's a bleed right there and increases the armored penetration by 30 percent for 15 seconds so if we activate back blast we can see that fletch it round tick away for six seconds if we um, go to our tactical our tactical plays a role in that fletch it round sucker punch damages triggers fletch it round so it ticks that extra damage of fletch it round and refreshes its duration, meaning it refreshes Fletcher Round. So, if I have a tactical advantage, which I need for Sucker Punch, I now do Back Blast to put Fletcher Round on. I can use Sucker Punch to refresh it. And you saw how Round 2 kicked in. I had one upper hand, and Round 2, because the target was bleeding, every 10 seconds gives me another upper hand. Let's have a look at that again. I have one upper hand i put a bleed target on fletcher drown i have the one advanced upper hand i used it and gained another one i can use it again i can do that once every 10 seconds and i have to refresh fletcher round once every within the six second time frame let's have a look at how that complexity works so if every third ability is Sucker Punch, I can keep Fletcher Round around. So let's have a look at that. So one ability, two abilities, three abilities, and I refresh it. I can do one ability, and then this would have been my third ability, and I can refresh it. One ability, two abilities, and then third ability is Sucker Punch. So if I just keep that in mind, every third ability sh should at least be Sucker Punch to keep that Fletcher Round alive. Let's look at if we try to push the envelope. So I'm going to do um, try to make it the fourth ability. So one, two, three, fourth, and it fell off before I could do it. So it has to be that third ability on each uh, part of my rotation. That's one of the contentions of the priorities that play a role. It's more important to keep that Fletcher round going because the timing is such that what we have to look at what Blood Boiler does. So Blood Boiler will only explode on a target when a bleed effect ticks. And it's usually the second tick. So I'm going to put Blood Boiler on a target. It sits there for about uh, 16 seconds and see nothing happens. I put a bleed effect on the, t well, it fell off with the dummy resetting. Blood boiler, battle shot. So one tick, there it goes. Second tick and it explodes. Okay. So to get blood boiler to tick, we need a bleed damage to tick. We try not to use vital shot, even though it's a great DPS th scenario. It's not necessary in part of our rotation for our main rotation. We can use the Fletcher round to do that. So, blood boiler, and there goes the blood boiler ticking. We could hear it explode. So why is blood boiler so important? Well, blood boiler, uh, when it explodes, grants hot and ready. Damage dealt by Blood Boiler marks the target with Hot and Ready, allowing your next back blast against the target to be usable while face to face with the target and treat it as though the attack from stealth. This at stealth damage gets effectively activated by Hot and Ready. Hot and Ready becomes available when Blood Boiler has exploded. That's how we really crank up the damage for back blast. Okay, so. There's all of these complicated mechanics in here, and we have to keep track of some of it. The most important setup is to keep track of our upper hands, or tactical advantage if you're on the Imperial side. We have to keep track of this, because we have a scenario in where we can get to two stacks. We are in a situation where we can activate another ability to give us a third stack, but we're capped at two stacks. 
in that scenario, we need to burn down our upper hands a little bit so we can make some space in the, uh, ro the rotation. And that's going to require us to be uh, using a sucker punch. And then we need to, we can get some ability that gives us another upper hand to build up that stack. Managing that is one of the pressures that you have to be aware of. And this is where I feel that some of the complications of those uh, class really develops. You have to keep track, not of what, not only just your abilities that come around, you have to keep track of your buff bot tray. And the reason why this is complicated and you can't be on a fixed rotation is the timing of the abilities. So back blast is at 10.2 seconds cooldown. Bludgeon is at 5.1. So those are synced up. We can predict those. But round two is at 10 seconds. And it might seem like, oh, that's close enough. It is not. Because this activates whenever you use one of your other abilities. When you use the upper hand, which is Sucker Punch. And because you use that and on a 10 second interval, it can drift. You cannot predict when that's going to happen. And it, it's predictable in the timing of it. It's just not predictable in your rotation because you'll get to a certain part where those 0.2 and 0.1 values have shifted. And keep in mind, our global cooldown is at 1.4 seconds. That also is going to have an effect on our rotation shifting. Blood boiler is at 15.4 seconds. So again, not lined up. We cannot line these abilities up as easily. We need to keep track of something else as well. So we looked at what the Fletcher round does. Um, the bottom part of it is increased armor penetration for 30% for 15 seconds. It has another buff called rolling punches. Backblast grants uh, rolling punches, which increases the ranged and tech critical chance by 10% for 15 seconds. So again, incredible buff. Uh, in addition, damage dealt by bludgeon causes the target to become susceptible for 45 seconds. Susceptible targets take 5% more damage from tech attacks. So we want to keep Backblast activated at least once every 15 seconds if we can. That means it doesn't align with the blood boiler. Now, this can all be potentially tweaked. Um, I just want to make clear that if we can push our alacrity a little bit higher, these values are affected by alacrity. There is a potential to bring this in line with a 15 second cooldown. The problem is, is that at what cost are you suffering that? You don't want to give up accuracy. And look, I'm not even exactly at the t a nine or which will give me 10% accuracy level. So I'm already pushing the limit there. The critical values really matter. Um, so you're going to suffer a lot of critical loss to get these values to align, to get to a point where this becomes something that is uh, related to a fixed rotation. But it doesn't necessarily fix some of your other complexities. So I don't know if it's really worth investing that heavily in alacrity to get these numbers correct that said it still will not help you with your upper hand management you'll still need to be prepared to deal with that energy cost we're an energy starving ability uh, rotation meaning that at some point we can have an energy problem we have cool head on the uh, scrapper side it's a one minute, 42 second cooldown. We have an, a way to deal with that. And that's to use a weave in an ability that doesn't use energy. And in this case, it's crippling shot. So let's have a quick look on the ability tree. I know we're jumping around on the ability tree, but it's easier to weave these concepts in at the right moment. Line 39 has an effect related to what shank shot is. We can make shank shot a crippling shot. When it's a crippling shot, it grants us an upper hand when we activate it. The other ability um, from rooting a target is not really that big. Um, the other option is setup shot, which a lot of people like to take. And there is a little bit of merit to it. I will explain why I don't think it's that beneficial. 
but Chunk Shot causes the next direct damage attack against the target to critically hit. This effect lasts 10 seconds. Okay, let's just quickly look at what that does. If we were to do this ability, and now it becomes Shank Shot instead of Crippling Shot. If I was to use Shank Shot, it'll guarantee that crit. Okay, and that's how most people use it. Uh, people will use Shank Shot prior to Backblast. The timing is such that Shank Shot is at 12.8 second cooldown, and Backblast is at 10.2 second cooldown. Not the greatest. Um, it's not the worst either. Keep in mind, we are using Backblast whenever we want to get Rolling Punches refreshed, which is more important and why it has such a high priority in the rotation is because we want Fletch It Round, um, the buff for Armor Penetration, and Rolling Punches buffs. We want those to be active constantly. So this still will work. It just means that Backblast is going to take a little bit of a cooldown that's longer. Instead of 10.2 seconds activation, we're going to now have a priority where it should be on every 12.8 seconds. Okay, that can still work. Uh, let me demonstrate why I think Crippling Shot is a better option. And for this, we're going to look at what our critical values look like. So we scroll down and we look at our critical chance. On the base, I'm at 35% with a 64% uh, crit critical multiplier. If I activate Backblast, I'm up at 50% already. And as I go through my rotation, look at the numbers. There's my Relic that crits. But I'm staying at 65% baseline. And I'm going to demonstrate how the average is actually going to creep up to 70, 72%. Now I'm at 74%, and I haven't even activated Pugnacity. There goes 80% critical multiplier. So, for me to activate setup shots, crit damage, boost... Um, I will demonstrate it's going to yield about 500 DPS increase. Not 500,000, but 500 itself. But we're going to give up an upper hand activating. And that utility is a bigger opportunity than we might think. There are many scenarios in a, a fight where you, you might not be able to move. You have to stand in a specific spot. And to have to fall back on trick move to get you another upper hand when you're starving from upper hands is a risky maneuver in certain fights so you might want to fall back on crippling shot we do have to have crippling shot whether it's crippling shot or shank shot we have to weave it into our rotation um, the difference is is how often do we have to weave it in and that's where i feel that the, there's a wash in the dps numbers if we have to weave it in over only once every two times we use Backblast, then we are activating a much bigger ability because the crit boost that we get is going to be minimal. Um, keep in mind, we're going to crit almost all the time. But that crit boost is going to be minimal. And instead, we're using an ability that is one of the weakest in our rotation. If we look at this, this is 12,500 DPS. Uh, damage. All of our other abilities are 22,000, 21,000, uh, 25,000, and 25,000 here on the low end, and we might actually activate the 32,000. So, Crippling Shot as taking a place holder in every rotation of Backblast is potentially on its own that difference in damage is we will make up that difference by just activating backblast so in my experience the changes are negligent in having set up shot it's a minimal difference in what you're going to have just because instead of using shank shot every time you use backblast you now can skip it. Sometimes you can skip it three or four times and just get to backblast more. 
And that's really going to crank up your DPS because you're using bigger hitting abilities in there. <clears throat> Let's just look at the best defense. It is something we have to consider. The heal from it is just absolutely pathetic. So don't even look at that 50% damage it deals uh, causing the target. Um, you know, it you, you're stealing 50% of the damage that you're doing. And its damage is just 12,000 and you can activate it only once every 12.8 seconds. So it's stealing 6,000 here health every 12.8 seconds. It's pathetic. They can just remove it and the other part of it is much more uh, effective. The last part is more worth considering. It's 20% less damage to you for 6 seconds. That's a damage reduction for half of the time that the crippling shot is on. So if you activate it every time it comes off cooldown, that's a 20% damage reduction for half of the duration. That's worth looking into if you have a unique scenario. And this is something you have to consider with the scrapper. You have so many damage avoiding capabilities that we looked at um, that you have to consider that if you really have unique scenarios, you might want to do something like a crippling shot where you have another damage avoiding ability if that's the role that you're going to be playing in a certain fight. So it's worth considering. By default, I feel like crippling shot does way more for us uh, because of that upper hand. Okay, let's go through the rest of the ability tree and see where everything creeps into. In Sucker Punch, uh, we're going to do Rolling Fist. Sucker Punch critical hit chance is increased by 10%. Activating Sucker Punch reduces the pugnacity cooldown by 10 seconds. Wow, huge, huge, huge buff. Pugnacity gives us an upper hand. But not only that, it increases our critical damage by 15% for 15 seconds. And we now can take that 1 minute 40 second cooldown to 14 seconds uh, we, we can really reduce it down because we're cutting off 10 seconds so we can almost divide that whole thing 102 seconds so if we could just activate sucker punch after sucker punch the global we means that we need about uh, 10 sucker punches and we reset this so giving that as a con concept so if it's every sucker punch activate it if we could just chain them back to back 10 sucker punches if we look at the global cooldown that is uh, 1.4 seconds 1 14 seconds if we could just activate sucker punch back to back then we would have pugnacity back so the truth of it is is that we can get a lot of sucker punches flowing but it's about every 20 seconds or so that pugnacity comes back so we have 15 seconds up of that damage increase if we really get on the sucker punches, we can really get that pugnacity around every 20, 25 seconds. So it's around almost all the time. Really, really big buff here. Line 27, Stratic Surrender. Reduces the cooldown of dodge by 15 seconds. While dodge is active, your movement speed is increased by 100%. And the damage you take from area effects is reduced by 60%. In the Ruffian option, this is this doesn't get the cooldown debuff um the cooldown buff from uh, six, uh, 60 seconds down to 45 seconds so for the ruffian this is a one minute in the scrapper that's now down to 45 seconds and we'll look a little bit later up the tree how this even gets down to 22 seconds line 43 upper critical critical hitting with uh, with the direct damage attack applies upper critical to you which increases your critical hit chance by two percent per stack Stacks up to 5 times and lasts 8 seconds. Activating Pugnacity to purchase movement based effects and grants 5 stacks of upper critical. Okay, so Pugnacity gets us there. Every time we have a direct damage attack that crits, there is one stack. There's two stacks. Keep in mind that our crit values get really high. There's four stacks. There's five stacks. We can keep this alive all the time. 
and pugnacity instantly gets us there so on the start of the fight if we use pugnacity we can instantly boost up to five stacks get upper critical going and we can maintain it we have eight seconds to get another critical hit very doable in a rotation so very very powerful option there um the other options are worth looking into but as a damage boost this really is just such a constant effect that i feel like it's the best choice line 51 scar tissue increases damage reduction by five percent the other options is sneaky increasing your movement speed by 15 percent and effective stealth by three we have a lot of movement abilities like scram a sca scamper and keep in mind that our dodge is now our movement effect boost as well it gives us that 100% um, speed um, for the duration which is for four seconds so we have movement abilities so we have trick move as well so we really don't need the sneaky and the stealth boost is not worth looking into um, we are one of the highest stealthing classes out there between the two stealthing classes the uh, scrapper is um the scoundrel and the operative i mean is the highest stealthing you know you if you look at pvp the distances are incredible flee the scene reduces the cooldown of disappearing act by 30 seconds and activating disappearing act increases the movement speed by 50 percent for six seconds this used to be a useful ability but in instances which means in flashpoints operations and in uh, any ability thing that we are in a storyline where you're in an instance your disappearing act no longer gets you out of combat and that is a very bad thing to try and invest in <laughs> because you can't really use it to avoid damage you can't use it like you did in the past to get behind a target and back blast the target um, if you wanted to do that disappearing act doesn't get you out of combat it, in an open world scenario yes it does but in open worlds, most of the fights that you're in are really not a challenge. So to invest in your disappearing act being worth something to you is not really that handy. There are scenarios where disappearing act is still worth something, but I wouldn't rely on it. So best of one year of scar tissue, 64 med screen your defense screen heals you for five percent of your maximum health when it disappears so as the ruffian does defense screen avoids thirty thousand damage so when we activate it it sits there on your buff tray when it, you get the damage it will pop off or after 10 seconds it drops off so whenever it drops off you get this twenty thousand heal related to how many hit points you have that heal will never crit it'll never crit it's not an actual heal it's just a recovery of your hit points but we can add this num these numbers together and look at it as a damage avoidance number so it's 30,000 damage that it avoids and then heals you for 20,000 so it looks more like a 50,000 damage avoidance ability okay the other option is just keep cool have a the restore 15 additional energy i feel that this is like one of the worst options you could ever go to cool head um restores 50 energy over three seconds it has a one minute and 42 second cooldown so this will take it to um 65 it really when we activate it is um related to how our energy re reserves work so when you fall below 60% energy, your, these four chevrons would decrease. Instead of four chevrons, we go to three. And that reduces, this is how much energy we are uh, restoring every second. Um, and it reduces how much energy we restore when we're below 60%. Uh, below, I think it's 50%, we lose another chevron. And at 25, we lose another one. And when we get down to zero, we have no almost no energy restoration we have to wait for it so activating this really late in the rotation uh late in the energy um pool is really not going to save us so those that, that 15 uh, extra value is very rarely worth anything it's more effective to activate cool head 
as soon as we drop below the 60. It would have been more handy if keep cool had a time reduction. If it reduces the time of keep uh, cool head by 15 seconds, that would have been worth it. Skedaddle, not really that useful because uh, its intended effect was to grant uh, two seconds of dodge. That two seconds of dodge would work like this dodge, which is a full cleanse. So if there's any cleansable damage over time on you, it would have cleansed you when you used Disappearing Act, meaning that you wouldn't have been pulled back into combat when you used Disappearing Act. That's its intended effect. But since you cannot leave combat while in an instance, this no longer works. So, line 68, a trick move. The benefit with this trick move is that it gives you a tactical uh, advantage or upper hand when, it's, uh, uh, when you use trick move or hollow traverse. The next uh, one is Flash Grenade. It is really handy in some scenarios where the Pounder Flash that uh, this last part is uh, when Flash Grenade ends, it leaves fl a Flash Powder that residues, that uh, reduces the accuracy of the target by 20% for 8 seconds. This is great in mobs uh, where you can reduce the accuracy by 20%. It's basically an effective. Uh, dodge for eight seconds uh, can be really really powerful um, and it even works on targets that you're damaging that doesn't actually get the stun effect as soon as that powder uh, triggers it can reduce the accuracies and I sometimes will use it that way as a intended effect smuggle smuggle no longer is worth much it was iffy back in 6.3 uh, the reason why is that your companions don't get the uh, stealth level that you get. So their proximity to uh, enemies have to be really carefully managed. They really have to hug corners to try and avoid uh, getting spotted by enemies. So it was already an iffy one to give up one of these two other abilities just for a smuggle. Maybe once in a while I'll quickly switch to that just to get a group by. But really, so easy to kill the group these days. Line 73, um, scr Scramble. Every time you get attacked, the active cooldown of your dodge is reduced by 3 seconds. This effect cannot occur more than once every 1.5 seconds. Effectively halves the time for your dodge. So from 44, 45 seconds down to 22.5 seconds. It is incredibly good. Back at you. <clears throat> Looks really good at first. But what you have to understand at back at you is that uh, you actually have to take the damage to reflect the damage. You're not really reflecting damage. You're just returning damage. It looks like a reflect, and if you, you've used two reflects, you think it looks good. It's not. You actually have to take the damage. So dodge is a really good uh, way of avoiding damage. So the conflict there is that you're either going to avoid the damage, which then means that damage doesn't get returned, or when you do take the damage hit, it's now only 150% returning back to the damage. So yeah, great, but it, it doesn't do as much as you would like to, to do. It, it's, it's an iffy situation. Um, if you use Scamper while you have the dodge on, you're not taking the damage, so that damage doesn't return. You actually have to get hit by this damage, and that's the frustrating part about this uh, setup. KO really back blast uh, and point blank shot interrupts and knocks down the target for three seconds. This doesn't work against champions, um, so it really doesn't do much. Um, so the times where you really would see a benefit with this um, is is minimal, and the target that really the target, if you wanted to kill it, that would be affected by this is some, a target that's weak enough that you probably can just blow through it or stealth past it. Um, so really not a great choice. We do have to look at Slippery Devil. Increases your effective stealth by two. Okay, so great stealth there. In addition, when you activate Scamper, you dodge or resist all incoming attacks for 1.5 seconds. This applies to just about every damage in the game. Scamper allows you to avoid that damage. Um, we can look at it. There's that buff on the tray. 
there it is. Keep in mind you get a new scamper every 8 seconds. You have 2 to start with. So every 8 seconds you can avoid any damage. We've seen this being used um, earlier. But that's where it comes from. Is this uh, slippery devil. Okay. Let's go through a little bit of an example of a rotation. Uh, we want to get pugnacity going first. To get this upper critical. Um, I'm going to start off with backblast to start getting those uh, damage buffs. <clears throat> um, but let's, uh, we do have to look at hot and ready, sorry. <clears throat> hot and ready, damage dealt by blood border marks the target with hot and ready, allowing your next backblast against the target to be usable while face to face with the target and treat it as though it's the attack from stealth. It has an additional effect when Blood Boiler is on a target. So let's go. There's Blood Boiler. We have one upper hand. If I now use Back Blast, I get a second upper hand. So whenever Hot and Ready is on a target and we use Back Blast, we get a free upper hand. So Blood Boiler, effectively look at it as another upper hand um, every 16 seconds or 15.4 seconds then um, it also increases our stealth because basically with hot and ready it's the the face to face that treated as though you attacked from stealth so it turns our back blast into that beefy hit with stealth but as a starting rotation we rather want to get the fletched round going and we want to get the rolling punches going so those buffs are also in consideration so think of these as issues that are on contentions with each other which buff do you want to get started first and the issue is that you can't do them all at the same time you have to start somewhere so when i'm behind the target i just go pugnacity backblast bludgeon and blood boiler start doing some sucker punches and that's my startup rotation. When I'm in front of the target, I go Pugnacity, Blood Boiler. I now have to do Vital Shot because um, if the target is facing me, I can't do Back Blast. That puts Fletch at round a dot on the target. I can, can no longer do that because I'm not from behind the target. So I need Vital Shot as a dot to trigger Blood Boiler. That gives me hot and ready. And now my Back Blast comes into rotation. Um, so the only difference in it is that you see a little bit better spike going from behind the target because you get that back blast going, which means all of that armor penetration bonuses start kicking in um, when you start getting the blood boiler and the bludgeon and the sucker punches going. Um, just because of those, all of those benefits, one from Fletcher round, the 30% uh, penetration, the other one from rolling punches, which is the 5% damage increase and the 10% critical hit chance increase for 15 seconds. All of those benefits are on the in effect when we start earlier with back blast. It's also why back blast has such a high priority in the priority rotation. We sometimes want to delay it if we see that we have a blood boiler that's about to trigger. Um, we might want to save that back blast just to get that free upper hand because. These are the concepts that are in contention with each other. Managing our upper hands and managing our buffs. These are in contention on the timing of the whole rotation. Okay, so pugnacity, back blast, blood, blood boiler. Let's get two sucker punches going. We can come back to bludgeon, another two sucker punches. And now our back blast is a stealth back blast buff. And let's do another sucker punch, bludgeon, sucker punch. We get another free one. Let's do Blood Boiler, Bludgeon, Sucker Punch, Back Blast, Free Back Blast. Let's do Pugnacity, Bludgeon, Sucker Punch. Trick move to get another Blood Boiler. We're about to get another Hot and Ready. Might as well wait for that for our Back Blast. Bludgeon. And I'm clicking and I'm up at 28,000. There should already be an indication that our DPS can go nuts. I'm clicking, which I'm not usually a clicker. And we haven't done the debuff on our dummy with the dummy training. 
um, and I'm already was up at 28,000 and just giving out commentation commentary as I was doing it at 28,000 okay let's have a look and see what I can do when I really crank it up keep an eye on this section over here if you want to see what my rotation is it's going to be a little bit delayed just because of the combat logs being delayed but you can see what I'm going to be activating so start with Pugnacity, Backblast, Bludgeon, Blood Boiler, Sucker Punches, 1, 2, Bludgeon, Backblast, Bludgeon. Up at 48,000. About to get a hot and ready, might as well wait for that. Another one coming up, so can delay that. Needed to do cool head there, I was getting energy starved. And now I need to start doing crippling shots in there for my energy management. And this is, I'm at 34,000, I'm at 20 million, uh, 2 million hit points in, and my holding 34,000 DPS. Going to do a crippling shot to make sure I can restore some energy. And now, my blood boiler is going to be a little bit delayed, I did a back blast earlier. Crippling shot for some energy management, pugnacity. And I keep an eye on the buff tray for my upper hands. And this is really important to make sure that I keep an eye on that upper hand. I'm going to get energy starved here, so crippling shot. Holding 34,000 DPS. Okay, let's stop it there. It's a very, very attainable. 34,000. I would say 32,000 is a very reasonable number um, in this class. If you're really cranking it out, yeah, you can get to 34,000. Um, but it's a little bit of opportune moments that hit that gets you to the 34,000 range. If we crank back the time a little bit, just gonna crank back here where we are up at 34,000. Look at the actions per minute. The reason this is attainable actions per minute has to do with how pugnacity and trick move works. Trick move and pugnacity are not on the global cooldown. So if I hit an ability, let's do scamper for example, see the curtain that comes over these abilities. Well, they come over trick move as well, but and they come over they don't come over pugnacity but pugnacity is an instant cast meaning that we can have a global cooldown and we can activate pugnacity trick move even though it's an instant cast doesn't activate the curtain so watch for that it's a very fast little curtain um, it's not the global cooldown curtain so it means that as the curtain falls off we can use a trick move and then get right back into our rotation um, that gives us a really high benefit on actions per minute. Pugnacity comes around right about um, every 20, 25 seconds. So that gets an, uh, um, an ability that doesn't you know, activate the global cooldown. So that's how we're getting these high actions per minute. And that's what's really going to yield you the DPS. A really attainable number is 48. 48 translates to around 3,100, 3,200 DPS. Let's look at the changes that occur when we're in front of the target. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. Our backblast can only now be activated every 16 seconds. What I want you to take note of is these two buffs, Fletch It Round and Rolling Punches. They have a 15 second cooldown. If we are really as tight as we can be on backblast, they'll be falling off as we're activating backblast. And that's about the best we can do um, 
with the scenario where we're facing a target. So let's see what we can do. So Pugnacity, vital shot this time to get that. And those buffs, rolling punches and fletch it around. And now we go to Blood Boiler again. And you saw them just fall off. And here comes Blood Boiler. And look at those buffs. Just fell off when I put it back on. And we're up at 33,000. Okay. So... Just want to cover that again. Um, I needed to debuff the dummy to get real values there. So the blood boiler and blood back blast are going to now be forced to be in sync. We're going to lose those buffs. But if we time it in such a way that the back blast is about to be ready as soon as they fall off, the only effect that's not going to have a benefit from that is the back blast so keep in mind the back bar blast applies the, those uh, buffs so our back blast now loses those buffs because they're not on us when we activate back blast um, so that's a little bit of a, a downside but it's about the best we can do and this is what happens when you're solo fighting if you have a good tank it's great to be behind them and you just can free cast um, but in a scenario where we are the solo fighter, we still can achieve incredible DPS numbers. We just need to be aware that um, we're a little bit hampered by what flexibilities we have. If you're going into an uh, instance with an operation training dummy, I just want to make you aware of a little bug that occurs from time to time. My alacrity is 2067. If we mouse over my blood boiler, it's 15.4. That's a similar number that you should be seeing. If your blood boiler is at 16 seconds, you have an instance problem. Either leave the instance and come back, try removing your armor and putting it back on. It does happen from time to time. At 7.0, there's a bug. Uh, that creeps up once in a while and you suddenly just won't be doing DPS. You don't know why, like it looks terrible, the class looks terrible. You don't know what's going on. Make sure that these numbers match. It should be something around there. If you have higher alacrity, you might see a number a little bit lower than 15.4 on your blood boiler. But just be aware of this little problem. So let's just make sure that we understand crippling shot. Crippling shot gives us an upper hand, but it doesn't consume energy. So let's look every one of our abilities, blood boiler included, sucker punch included, back blast included, uses uh, energy. And we take energy back. But if we, let's get our energy, look at crippling shot, it never consumes energy. So when we start starving of energy, we have to start weaving in crippling shot. So off of the start, we can avoid crippling shot because we have our cool head available. We can use cool head to um, get our energy back to normal. I wait until I start seeing a chevron, losing a chevron. If I instantly lose a chevron and get it back again, I'm not panicked yet. I wait for it to drop and just, you know, for about one or two seconds, lose a chevron. Then I activate cool head. Then I know I'm good for a little bit. Um, then I need to start work, worrying about getting crippling shot in there. Uh, I might weave in a crippling shot earlier on just to get that upper hand going and just keep those sucker punches going because keep in mind, sucker punch reduces pugnacity. So this is the complexity of this class. We have so many issues in contention with each other. We have hot and ready that we have to manage. We have to manage our rolling punches and fletch it round. We have to keep fletched around on the target by doing sucker punches uh, on every third ability. Um, back blast cannot be activated if you're facing a target in the front without hot and ready. So our blood boiler needs to be put on. Blood boiler cannot be uh, activated without a dot on the target, which is either fletched around or vital shot. 
We don't want to use Vital Shot too much because we can um, use some of our other abilities, but it can work as a good filler if we don't have an upper hand ready. So uh, we have to manage our upper hand as well. In 7.0, we got we lost uh, one possible stack of our upper hands. We used to be able to go to three. Now we can only go to two. So it's a much tougher rotation to manage. So all of these uh, issues are in contention with each other. It's better to just to get comfortable with them. And the only way to do that is practice. Practice, practice, practice. This class, as you saw, can sustain 32, 33, even 34,000 DPS very comfortably if you're comfortable with the rotation. It can avoid damage without any problems. We have scamper, we have dodge, we have defense screen. Um, and never ever forget your shield adrenal. Because of the DPS you do, I never even consider critical adrenal. My shield adrenal is much, much more effective. I have so much damage avoidance that I'd rather have another one that can help me out there uh, so that I can just keep doing DPS. If I don't want to activate a damage avoidance ability, I would rather use a shield adrenal. Okay, and keep in mind, shield adrenals are instant cast. Um, so I can have a scamper. You see, never the, the curtain never went over it. So I can activate it. It never activates the curtain. So it's a great ability to pull in to avoid damage without affecting my rotation. It, in fact, increases my DPS, in my opinion, more than it does with the critical adrenal. With the simple fact that I'm not effective affecting the timing of my rotation your uh, stack the deck is a raid buff it's really complicated to involve stack the deck as a, a scrapper uh, we don't have just free upper hands floating around and it consumes an upper hand so keep in mind that this effect can dramatically affect your rotation if you're not prepared for it just including stack the deck is something that you have to plan for and it might be a situation where you just have a cool head you burn that cripple you're gonna go to a crippling shot to give you an extra upper hand so you're at two stacks of our upper hand you consume stack the deck make sure you didn't gain a free one from round two then activate maybe be crip crippling shot to get that extra one or use a trick move however you need to do it be prepared that you're gonna uh, for that situation it's um only going to be attainable if you want to keep that high dps if you practice this okay here on the imperial side let's just familiarize ourselves with some of the abilities instead of pugnacity we have stim boost we now have backstab crippling throw laceration veiled strike Corrosive Dart, Volatile Substance. Instead of Trick Move, we have Hollow Traverse. Scamper is now Exfiltrate. Our Adrenal Probe is now our Cool Head. And then we have Evasion and Shield Probe as our Defensives. Let's look at um, we are Tactical Opportunity is the one that gives us our uh, new upper hand every 10 seconds on a Bleeding Target. We have Acid Blade that we have to keep alive. And we apply it with a backstab. It also has the 30% armor penetration for 15 seconds. Instead of rolling punches, we have calculated frenzy, which is the 5% damage increase and the 10% critical chance for 15 seconds. Um, revealing weakness is our hot and ready. So um, be prepared to be dealing with those uh, contentions with the uh, priorities. Let me get set up here and we can do some dummy parsing. Okay, let's have a look.
still have time on those buffs. Let's see, I just fell off. A little bit poor management there. Should be easier this round. Still have the buffs, there they go. Backstab. Still have time on those buffs, there they go. Time this time around. Just fell off. I have my adrenal probe back. So, 33,000 this time around. Very attainable. A little bit of work. Okay. I think we'll end it here. Yeah, 33,000. Um... It is a little bit of a randomness there, I would say, when you get to these high numbers, uh, randomness of crit values can really make a difference. Let's have a look at this a little bit. So, um, here is our star parse. Let's just go to an overview a little bit. You can see these big uh, crit numbers in there. Um, let's look at the damage abilities. Let's see, laceration now becomes a really big uh, feature. Our backstab, we had only 19 of the men in there, and that's what I wanted to pay attention to. We're critting about 89% of the time. Okay, so 89% of the time, these 19s were, um, were crits. And I wanted to go back to show you that to take that 89% to 100 for value that's only third in our rotation, we're only going to get a few more backstabs and we're giving up that upper hand that is way more useful. And this is where I wanted to point out this line 39, really, in my opinion, uh, the crippling throw or crippling shot is a much better choice. We can see that um, our acid blade poison um, is fourth in line so keeping that acid blade alive it actually is a bigger hit than you can think volatile substance um, not that big and it also does pretty well but it really is all about getting those um, hot and ready or um, revealing weakness out there for the uh, backstab to go really up there um, really a good class to play it takes a lot of practice to get right you have contention with so many priorities that need to be managed the upper hand i feel that if we had another stack of upper hand that we could go to to three upper hands they would be more of a pure rotation in that sense we would have that leniency to really go and prioritize certain abilities more effectively 
But because we have only two, we really have to be planful. We need to see how many upper hands we have. We actually have to watch as we consume an upper hand at two stacks so that we can manage this um, additional free one we get from tactical opportunities. So the only way you're going to get good at this is to practice. Um, I can totally see how somebody can only achieve maybe 22, 23,000 uh, DPS out of this with all of the same armor sets that I have just because they're struggling so much with the the, um, the priorities that they have to manage. It's not just the ability priority. And you have no gold outlines. There's never a gold outline to tell you, oh, this ability is buffed or this ability is not buffed. In addition, when I'm practicing, I'm keeping an eye on the rolling punches or the calculated frenzy. I'm keeping an eye on the asset blade or the fletched round buffs on me. I know I can delay my backstab uh, until those buffs are about to fall off, uh, which sometimes gives me the ability to wait for volatile substance or blood boiler to trick the hot and ready or revealing weakness buff. And then I get a benefit of the, the extra damage from backstab. It is the struggles that I'm facing with these days is timing my stem boost and pugnacity, just to let you know that is where I am uh also glaring at my eyes are going to this timing can i get in another laceration or if it is at one second cooldown why would i burn another laceration if i don't have if i'm already at one upper hand and i can activate something like volatile substance to give me that timing um because of the global cooldown i know this will be available i can activate that get the crit chance from that use a laceration that then is now going to give me a, a that damage boost on laceration then go into a veiled strike and this is just the the nuances that you're playing with um where this is the difference that you're going to get between 30,000 dps and going up to 34,000 DPS. Um, it is really, really difficult. It used to be a lot easier to play, um, but it's, in my opinion, one of the toughest louses because you're managing so much. Good luck with this. It's very rewarding when you do really well. It is incredible how much survivability you have and how much fun you can have with this class. And the, just the, all the little nuances of where you can get with your Exfiltrate and Scamper. Um, things that you can do because you're a stealthing class. It is just so exciting when you get it right. Um, but it is really, really tough to manage. Uh, but very rewarding. Thank you. I hope you enjoy this guide.